Okay. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to Robust American Love. My name is Karen Carboner, and I am president of the Walt Whitman Initiative, a 501c3 organization whose mission is to celebrate New York City's literary legacy. And we also serve as an organizing center for cultural activism and poetry related events, such as the one you're just about to enjoy. Please follow us on Facebook and Instagram and tune into our YouTube channel to explore more presentations in our robust American Love speaker series. And if you like what we're doing, there are many ways to support our programs and initiatives. Please visit our website to find out how or write to walt at waltwhitmaninitiative.org. We decided to offer the speaker series, note the word speaker, not lecture, to present timely public facing conversations on Whitman's life, work and legacy. You'll hear conversations and enjoy presentations by teachers, poets, grad students, artists, printers, neighborhood activists, you name it. They're not designed to be academic talks, but free, open, informal discussions that we hope that uh, you will be part of by just asking questions at the end. So if you are watching on YouTube right now, please make sure to post your questions in the chat section. Um, and if you miss one of these events, you can always catch them later on our YouTube channel. Um, just letting you all know what's coming up for us. We have been doing this series now since last August and we kept up a pretty manic pace last year doing it almost every week. Um, we've decided to slow down a little bit and enjoy the the incredible quality of our speakers and just also give our amazing new interns a chance to really get busy with some of our um, social uh, media and social networking that we're doing too. So I wanna welcome them, Sam and Razy and Freddie. It's great to have you on board with the Whitman Initiative. Thank you so much uh, for being part of our team. Um, and speaking of our team, uh, Next month's Robust American Love presentation, as I said, we're going to be doing these monthly now, which will be Tuesday, February 16th at 6 p.m. It's called Local Heart, Global Impact, a tribute to Whitman specialist, Greg Truppiano. Uh, just saying his name makes me smile. Greg was a very, very close and dear friend for so many of us. He was part of the Whitman Initiative. Uh, we did lose Greg last year right around that time of that presentation, but this is not meant to be a sad uh, memorial for him, but instead a real celebration of an incredibly exuberant Whitmaniac. I hope you will join us. Uh, many, many people will be joining us here on screen, including Greg's longtime partner, Lon Black. Hey, Lon, I think you're watching us tonight. Good to have you there. Karin Kunrad, the director of Campagna de Columbari, uh, very dear to so many of us, uh, incredible performance troupe, and she will be talking about Greg's effect on her work. Dee Kui, who's also part of the Whitman Initiative and an, a remarkable um, documentary uh, maker and uh, gave us, thank goodness, uh, a documentary, including Greg Truppiano, that's very dear to our, our hearts. Dee will be talking about that. Charles Jardin and Julian McGrone are um, Greg's longtime friends from uh, the Fort Greene Park Conservancy, an incredibly important organization in Whitman's Brooklyn. Uh, so they will have much to share about uh, Greg's famous tours of the park and, and the neighborhood. And then last but absolutely not least, Nicole Mitchell, who often sang at Greg's events a uh, spectacular contralto voice, uh, fresh out of Brooklyn. Nicole, we love you. We cannot wait to hear you again right here and, and celebrating our Greg. So everyone out there, please remember next month, February 16th, very excited to see you again at 6 p.m. Eastern Standard Time for that tribute to Greg Truppiano. Tonight, we have something very special too. I'm so excited. Um, and you, you all see Ted's vote poster behind wow. him there. Uh, very excited about inauguration day tomorrow, right? I, I'm not sure any of us are actually going to go to work or do the things we have to do. We'll be glued to that, um, that recording. And we thought we, you know, just for the first 
Robust American Love of the Year. We wanted to celebrate that. So we are presenting on Whitman on Democracy. And it's a very big topic, very juicy. So we decided to go with something you could really hold on to, sort of in the Whitmanic spirit. Um, we've got three curators who are going to be talking about six objects. And the whole idea here is that the three of us have selected out of many, many, many possibilities, two objects each to highlight and uh, kind of tie with Whitman's idea of, you know, as he called himself, the bard of democracy. So I'm not going to let you know about those objects. They're going to reveal themselves as we go along. So please sit back uh, with your beverage of choice and enjoy. Uh, we've got three, um, I, gosh, I'm gonna brag about myself if I say, we have three amazing curators. <laughs> well, anyway, we have two spectacular curators and one very enthusiastic uh, person who also curated. Um, I, I want to just introduce uh, dear friends and also part of uh, members of the Whitman Initiative. I have Ted Widmer here. Ted, so wonderful that you could join us today. Hi, Karen. Great to be here. And Ted was recently on the show because we talked about his really amazing book, Lincoln on the Verge, 13 Days to Washington, which was published by Simon & Schuster last year, just a, a couple of months ago. Uh, Ted is also the distinguished lecturer at the Macaulay Honors College of the City, Univer City University of New York. Um, he's directed research centers and libraries, notably at the Library of Congress, Brown University, and Washington College. And he was a speechwriter and senior advisor to President Bill Clinton. So Ted's got an incredible background as a writer, um, uh, especially a, a writer of speeches, but and, and also his book, which is magnificent. Today, though, we're going to highlight Ted as curator. So in 2019, he curated the Morgan Library's Whitman exhibition, which was called Walt Whitman, Bard of Democracy. Um, and uh, it was running concurrently with the exhibition that I was doing at the Grolier Club, which was called Poet of the Body, New York's Walt Whitman. And then also out there was Deirdre Lawrence, who had a spectacular exhibition at the Center for Book Arts. Deirdre, thank you so much for being here today. Thank you for inviting me. Such a such great company I'm keeping. Very excited about that. Mm -hmm. um, a bit about Deirdre. She was uh, the principal librarian at the Brooklyn Museum from 1983 to 2017. Did you guys hear those dates? Amazing, amazing. And that's when I got to know Deirdre. Um, uh, before that, she was an associate librarian at the Museum of Fine Arts in Boston and previously worked at other cultural institutions. Deirdre received her MLS from Pratt, local Brooklyn, wonderful institution, and has studied art history on the graduate level. At the Brooklyn Museum, she established the museum archives and implemented many projects to preserve and make accessible extensive research collections. Deirdre has written numerous articles and lectured frequently on the research collections held in the libraries and archives, as well as other collections held by the Brooklyn Museum. Um, she's curated a number of exhibitions. I've got a whole list for you here. The one that is staying very close to my heart is her 2019 exhibition, Walt Whitman's Words, Inspiring Artists Today uh, at the Center for Book Arts. And that spectacular catalog, Deirdre, that award-winning catalog that you all came out with. Can people still pick up a copy of that? I think it's still in print. Yeah. Ronnie Gross, who was the uh, designer, um, I think was creating more copies. So I can find out for you. Okay, well, it's not just for me, it's for those listeners out there. And I think maybe visiting the Center for Book Arts would be the place to check, right? If, if there are catalogs. So if you missed uh, the exhibition, too bad for you, but you can sort of re-experience it because the catalog is so profoundly interesting. It's almost experiential. Um, lots of things to do with this catalog. Um, she also curated previously Walt Whitman and the Art of the Book, Contemporary Visions that was at Poets House in 2015 and an exhibition called Artist Books at the Brooklyn Museum in 2000. 
um, many different essays here as well, Deirdre. Uh, I'm so pleased that you are here today and bringing your expertise. And we can't yeah. wait to hear about your objects that you're bringing to us. Um, I mentioned myself, I'm also here just chiming in with everybody else. I am the president of the Whitman Initiative, as I've told you guys uh, before. And I was very privileged to uh, co-curate this exhibition at the Grolier Club with Susan Jaffe Tain. Um, Susan is a, uh, a very good friend, a very dear friend and an incredible supporter of the Walt Whitman Initiative. In fact, she has recently generously donated to us and enabled us to offer our very first Whitman Tain Fellowship. And uh, for those of you that are graduate students that are listening, um, interested in studying Whitman, please pay attention to our website. Uh, by the end of the month, we should have our announcement out about our very first fellowship opportunity offered with Susan's, Susan Tain's generous support. So Susan, I know you're out there. Thank you so much for everything you've done for us and for uh, young aspiring scholars. Um, it's a great time to support the arts and academia. Okay, everyone. Um, so we've got a conversation here and it's kind of, I guess the way that we thought about it is we would go chronologically with our objects. And um, maybe though we can open up just a few minutes, guys, we're, we're talking about Whitman on democracy. Um, and uh, yeah, a great time to talk about the topic with the inauguration tomorrow. And I guess, you know, Ted, thinking about the title of your exhibition, The Bard of Democracy, I know this is something that you've thought a whole lot about. Um, do you wanna open us up with like, what, what do you think that Whitman, what, what was his concept of democracy? How do you get at that? Well, I, I think he'd be thrilled if, if if he's watching down on us from some other place, let's not get too religious too quickly, but um, <laughs> he uh, would be thrilled with the simple fact that the American people made a big decision. They rejected someone who wasn't working and we're going in a new direction. And I, I just think he would be happy that we have listened to the famous better angels of Lincoln's first in inaugural address. Um, Whitman grew up deeply immersed in the great democratic party of the 19th century and it, and it was great. Um, it was tainted by its association with the Southern branch of the democratic party, which always wanted to protect slavery. And at times it did terrible things, but it also represented the aspirations of poor people and a working class that was beginning to be more clearly shut out of the, the main chance of American prosperity. And Whitman growing up in Brooklyn as he did felt profoundly that someone like Andrew Jackson who took on the banks of, in his era was a hero. Jackson isn't exactly held up as a hero now in academic circles because of terrible things he did to Native Americans and, and to African Americans. But to a young man like Whitman, he was a hero for smashing the elite financial circles of the East Coast cities. And he was emotionally exciting as well as intellectually exciting. He was like an old war hero who was fighting bankers the way he once fought British invaders of the United States. So. So Whitman grew up with a lot of that, a lot of genuine patriotism. And it's always hard to talk about Jackson, but I, I think Whitman really looked up to him as a young man. And then as he got older, the challenge was, how did he stay a good Democrat when the National Democratic Party was so obviously rotten? It was, it was rotting before his eyes in much the same way that really both political parties in the late 1960s were sort of rotting before the eyes of young people and he didn't know what to believe in. So he started to believe in himself and that I think led to leaves of grass. So. Ted, I think you're leading us to your object, right? Shall we plunge right into the sure. presidency? 
So I'm going to share my screen and show everyone this image. And maybe you'd like to begin by just explicating what we're looking at. So, yeah, I want to say what a pleasure it was to be the curator of a Whitman ex exhibition in 2019, mainly because I discovered the community. I didn't know about the community. I was a solitary Whitmanist. And suddenly, and that, that's a feeble way to be a Whitmanist. And thanks to Karen and all of you, I, I met so many great people. And that was my big takeaway from 2019 was, wow, what a, what, what a great community. I've never been in a community like this around any intellectual figure. Um, so I was actually a, a last minute sub. I was a pinch hitter for the Morgan Library after they, they lost a curator. So I, I came in, but I'd been thinking about Whitman a long time. I wrote a dissertation read by no one, in, including my advisor. Um, <laughs> but I really loved the world of New York in the 1840s and 1850s and Whitman was a part of that. And the feelings of young people who were trying to get into politics and you know weren't sure how to get into this sometimes rotten and sometimes thrilling world. And so I had all these old memories of the Whitman pieces that I, I had read. And my slightly unusual uh, approach into Whitman was I loved his prose. I, I, I know most of you are poetry, poetry scholars, but um, when I was in grad school, I remember uh, I went into a used bookstore and I, I bought this book. It's a 1971 edition of Specimen Days issued by David R. Godin in Boston that's filled with um, photographs and pretty dense pages of his prose writings, Specimen Days. And then this amazing book came out in the late 80s, the Library of America book of the poetry and prose. And in that book, I, near the end, it's sort of tucked away curiously on page, let me get it, Ted, should I be showing our images? Because I realize like we're off screen because I wanted to show the whole 18th presidency, but are you showing a, a book? Oh, I, I did, but it's okay. I I, I held up a book, but it, it's fine. Um, <laughs> let, me, let me get us on screen. It'll be more exciting. Okay, guys. So uh, let me, I'll just put us on the side here. So now can you see me? Yes. So this is the book I loved in grad school, the David I, R. Godin Specimen Days. Beautifully Theater. printed. Yeah. I think Whitman would have appreciated the high quality of the paper and the printing. And then this book came out in the late 80s, the Library of America edition of the Poetry and Prose, edited by Justin Kaplan. And in the very back, on page 1307, how many books have a page 1307, um, was this odd publication called The 18th Presidency, which I've been fascinated with ever since. So when I was given the chance to curate the Morgan exhibit, as Karen mentioned, called uh, Bard of Democracy, I wanted to get at his thinking about the political system that surrounded him. And it was complicated to begin with, but it was also changing a lot in the middle of the 1950s. And in a nutshell, the Democratic Party was losing its soul. We've heard this cliche repeated quite a lot lately, the soul of America. And there was a feeling that nobody in Washington cared anymore about ethics. And so Whitman, after writing Leaves of Grass, writing and printing and publishing Leaves of Grass, he wrote this very curious prose document called the 18th Presidency. And it was set into type, and this is a proof sheet of a, of, of a typeset document, but never published as a book or booklet or, or anything until 1928, when it appeared in a book called Walt Whitman's Workshop. And then I don't think it appeared, then I, there was a 50s edition, I believe, and then it appears in the late 80s, Library of America, huge compilation of everything. And I just loved it. It fit with what I was doing at the time, which was studying angry young men in New York in the 1840s and 1850s. 
And it includes a kind of political program. It's almost like something you would read in Paris in 1968 or Mexico City or Prague in the same year. And it has a lot of the same feelings of 1968. It's quasi-literary, quasi-political. It's almost more an expression of a mood than an actual political statement. But it does have unforgettable language. And as I read it, I, I just um, loved certain unforgettable lines. So he he's really upset about the presidents. The presidents have not been good in the 1850s. Um, the Democratic Party had a lock on the presidency for most of the 1850s. And um, you've got Franklin Pierce elected in 1852, who's a northerner, but he just caves in to Southern pressure on slavery. And then in 1856, which is when this is written, sometime in around the election of 1856, James Buchanan is elected and he is another northerner, sort of. He's from Pennsylvania, but he's from a part of Pennsylvania that is pretty southern near, near Maryland. And he's just completely in bed with the South also. And in fact, is, is kind of the, the South's mm -hmm. handpicked candidate to, to advance the cause of slavery for four or more years. And immediately after he became president, the Dred Scott decision was uh, put through the Supreme Court and Buchanan was deeply involved and all this stuff is happening. And it just feels to a young Northern man with a strong sense of ethics and democracy that the fix is in. This government is terrible. They don't even understand democracy. They're just about money and enriching themselves and lobbying in Washington and whatever they can do to strengthen the horrific system of slavery that is so so dominant. So this is Whitman's angry manifesto against that and saying, can't we find something better? And there are amazing uh, lines about who is the president. The president is someone who, oh, here, I'm gonna quote literally. Um, yeah, the president, do you wanna take us anywhere in the document? You know where it is and I can it's zoom. It's under a heading called Lesson of the 16th and 17th Terms of the Presidency. Got it. Um, so about this, maybe the 10th sentence in there. I don't know if we can zoom any more, but I'll just read it. The president eats dirt and excrement <laughs> for his daily meals, likes it, and tries to force it on the states. The cushions of the presidency are nothing but filth and blood. The pavements of Congress are also bloody. So it's just really shocking. It's not just angry, it's shocking. You don't read a lot of references to excrement in the middle of the 19th century. And that's a high level of anger that Whit Whitman is feeling against James Buchanan, the sort of hapless Pennsylvania president, one term president. But then he also, in his way, or if you, if you go down a little bit, I'm just seeing a, uh, uh, maybe a few sentences down. He, there's a righteous rage against lynching, um, punishing by the lash, by tar and feathers, binding fast to rafts on the rivers or trees in the woods, and sometimes by death, all attempts to discuss the evils of slavery in its relation to white. So he's very bravely speaking out against the violence that was distributed to anyone with a conscience like Whitman who wanted to say slavery is not who we are as, as Americans. Um, and I like this because as, as we all know, Karen and I have talked about, there, there are some moments where we feel a little awkward about Whitman's use of racialized language, or he might you know, describe seeing a little old lady, a little old African-American lady as he's in, in a civil war scene. Here, there's some righteous anger um, about the slave hopple, the iron wristlet and the neck spike, the, the instruments of torture that were being held to keep down 
African Americans who who didn't want to be enslaved, or and also the punishing by the lash by tar and feathers of the white people who wanted to talk about it. So it's pretty powerful language. And then elsewhere in this somewhat directionless prose essay, the 18th presidency. I mean, it's 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 weird. It doesn't really. You know, you know, it doesn't have a beginning, middle, or end. It's just this sort of screed coming from Whitman, angry at presidents. Um, but elsewhere, and I think, Karen, if you go over to the left on the first column, mm -hmm. you might get, it's under a heading called, um, has much been done in the theory of these states. Got it. I'm getting really good at this, Ted. You are. And he starts to describe what he calls a redeemer president, the kind of president he hopes will, will show up and save America from these mediocre people who keep getting elected. And he says, um, there it is. I would be much pleased to see some heroic, shrewd, fully informed, healthy bodied, middle-aged, beard-faced American blacksmith or boatman come down from the West across the Alleghenies and walk into the presidency dressed in a clean suit of working attire and with a tan all over his face, breast and arms. I would certainly vote for that sort of man possessing the due requirements before any other candidate. It's unbelievable. It's like he's had a vision yeah. in this very strange document. He's had a vision of a man with a beard clean suit of working attire with a kind of tan on his face walking in from mm. the West. And it's 1856, it's four years before anyone has heard of Abraham Lincoln. And Whitman is seeing him with a kind of poet's vision and it's incredible. So I put this passage into the, the show at, at the Morgan because I thought it was so powerful. Wow, Ted, thank you so much. I'm going to zoom out of this and bring us back in here. Um, Thank you also for reminding me about the power of Whitman's prose because I'm one of those poetry people. Um, but seeing that, and I hadn't realized that, is that the particular passage where that uh, phrase redeemer president that Whitman um, later it, uses for Lincoln? It's is actually that... not in that passage, but it, it's in the same document, but it's in another part of it. Okay, wow. Well, thank you so much for leading us off and looking at a document that probably many uh, out there have not seen, I'm going to redirect and take you all probably to something that you've seen many, many times, but hopefully never get <laughs> tired of. And I'm going to share my screen too. Let's see if I can do this neatly and uh, bring you to the frontispiece of the 1855 edition of Leaves of Grass. Um, that is, of course, the first edition of The Leaves, the first book of poetry that Whitman would publish in his lifetime. Um, and he chose to do it really in an unusual way. Uh, if you've seen a copy or a facsimile, you realize very quickly that there's no author's name on the cover or the spine or even the title page. And instead you're faced uh, on the left with what is a, a traditional thing in a lot of 19th century books called a frontispiece, right? You've got an image of the author, um, but this is a really highly unusual image of this author. He actually sounds like, or looks like he's reciting uh, particular lines of Song of Myself, uh, the big poem in this collection. And I'm gonna read a passage that for me, always comes up when I look into the eyes of Whitman in this 1855 frontispiece. Section 24 of Song of Myself reads, Walt Whitman, a cosmos of Manhattan, the sun, turbulent, fleshy, sensual, eating, drinking, and breeding. No sentimentalist, no stander above men and women or apart from them, no more modest than immodest. Unscrew the locks from the doors. Unscrew the doors themselves from their jams. Whoever degrades another degrades me, and whatever is done or said returns at last to me. Through me the afflatus surging and surging, through me the current and index. 
I speak the password primeval. I give the sign of democracy. By God, I will accept nothing which all cannot have their counterpart of on the same terms. <laughs> I love that idea of the sign of democracy, right? I speak the password primeval, I give the sign of democracy. And if I am looking at the 1855 image here, um, again, this is a frontispiece illustration and you can quickly see that this is not a photograph. The technology to put photos in books had not yet been developed in 1855. So Whitman had to have his original daguerreotype taken by um, uh, Gabriel, um, oh gosh, no, can you believe it? I'm, it's a family. Harrison. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Deirdre. Taken by Gabriel Harrison, uh, right on Fulton Street in Brooklyn, and then made into a, uh, an engraving by Samuel Hollier. Um, and if you're looking at this for a sign of democracy, there are many, right? I, I think the, the uniform that he's wearing, which maybe at his time represented an American working person, but nowadays just it's an American uniform, right? It's a chinos and a, a shirt open with an undershirt peeking out. Um, famously, this image was actually used as a gap ad in the 1980s. So there's something profoundly democratic in the way that this author at least is portraying himself in terms of his clothes. Um, Another thing I love to take note of is that he's wearing a hat, which of course is another uncouth thing for anybody to do, especially at a moment of um, acknowledgement or recognition, right? He's facing the reader, one should don one's cap. Uh, but Whitman writes in the preface to the to Leaves of Grass, take off your hat to nothing known or unknown or to any man or number of men. And here he is greeting you on equal terms and yet leaving his hat on uh, very, uh, very notably. And then I guess lastly, of course, you, you look at the eyes here. He's looking so directly into your eyes. Um, if there is a sign of democracy, maybe it's that too, right? Um, he's, he, it's as if he's saying, you could be me, I could be you, right? Maybe song of myself is really song of yourself. So this kind of democratizing um, that you see in the image, I feel like also is represented in the way this particular frontispiece is done. And on this next slide, I compare a more typical idea of a frontispiece, uh, and that's uh, an edition of Longfellow. And you can see the notes on that on the left-hand corner there. Um, very typical to have a frontispiece of just the shoulders on up, right? This is the seat of learning. It's all about the intellect, right? Poetry is something that comes really from the mind more than anywhere else. And then you take a look at Walt's page and you realize that this is a revolution, right? It's not just about the mind. It's as much about the, the intellect or the soul as it is really about the body. Um, and this book is not just for some intellectually elite group. This is literally for every body out there. Uh, and I can't think of a more democratic way to depict oneself um, as, a, as a spokesperson, as the bard for, of, of democracy, than to put that image across from that very simple title page for Leaves of Grass. And uh, before I quit here, just one more kind of fun slide. And here I'm just showing three ways in which this image keeps on giving, keeps on representing a, a democratic ideal or a, a type of an American perfection through time. And on the left, you have uh, the fold out that came inside the CD uh, that Iggy Pop put out in um, 2014 called Kinder Autumns. He actually did a recording of the Children of Adams poem and depicted himself kind of as Walt Whitman in the 1855 frontispiece, right? Just coming out of the same pair of pants there. And speaking of pants in the middle, you have uh, the ad for Jay Peterman's Walt Whitman pants, which have been, the, they're a bestseller for them for over a decade. A uh, really fun and, and very accurate description of Whitman up top with again, the famous frontispiece. And on the right, just one kind of fun pop image of James Franco looking a whole lot like Walt. Uh, and he's attaching his face onto the top 
of another daguerreotype taken by Gabriel Harrison at the same sitting supposedly of the, the frontispiece image. So, um, so yeah, just putting in the idea of uh, democracy as something kind of rooted, not just in the poetry, but also in the, the imagery of leaves of grass. Um, that's the thing that I'm gonna throw out there. Um, but I think Ted, this is gonna go back to you now because we're okay. looking at Whitman through time, right? And you're gonna step it up to the civil war. Love to, and thank you for all that, Karen. So interesting. Um, You're welcome. Thank you. Big, big Iggy Pop fan, also. <laughs> um, so, four years goes by. Uh, Whitman expresses all that anger in the 18th presidency, but does not actually publish it. I don't know if he held it back or if he just could, couldn't scrape together the money to to publish it, and who really would have bought it anyway. It's kind of a strange document. But then in 1860, his poetic vision comes true. And a guy with a beard from the West is, is elected president. It's, it's amazing. It's, um, nobody had even heard of Abraham Lincoln as the year 1860 was beginning. And I, I found a, a book at the beginning of the year describe the 21 people who might get the nomination for the Republican party for president. Lincoln didn't crack 21 people. He wasn't mentioned in, in the book, but then he was fortunate. The convention was held in Chicago. He's from Springfield, Illinois. He had very good political handlers who were there. He was not there, but they, they were there. And it was just his moment. He was in the right, his politics were just right for that particular time in the year 1860 and he got the nomination and then other things worked out the democratic party that was always winning was always so powerful and Whitman is a democrat um, they split in half because really the whole country was splitting in half kind of like the way it feels now that people couldn't even talk about politics they were so angry and largely, I would say the South was just driving this because they wanted slavery to expand. They wanted it to be a central American institution. They didn't want to apologize for it anymore. They wanted it to be like respected and, and legal throughout the whole country. If you owned a slave in the South, you could travel to New York, stay in a hotel and no one would bother you. That's, that's what they wanted. Kind of like, I, I'm, find myself thinking about Donald Trump's golf courses. They just wanted to go from one golf course to the, to the next and have no one bother them. And the North was finally saying no and the split was happening inside the Democratic Party, which was very helpful to Abraham Lincoln because it divided the Democrats in half, which meant the Republicans would win for the first time. So, so Lincoln won and after winning, uh, South Carolina seceded and then six other states seceded. So half the country is no longer even in the United States of America. And you can imagine what that meant to someone like Walt Whitman, who has a really continental feeling of the country is great because it stretches from ocean to ocean. His own poetic vision is somehow great because it's commensurate with how big the land is in some, some way. Um, and so he's really upset about what's happening politically. And then on February 19th, 1861, the agent of the crisis comes into his field of vision. So he has described the man he wants to see four years earlier. And then suddenly he actually is standing right there in, in front of him. And it's a very powerful moment in the life of Walt Whitman. And we know how powerful it was because he wrote about it for the rest of his life. He gave lectures about Lincoln um, into the late 1880s till, till pretty close to his death. And they're, they're, they're really fascinating lectures from every point of view. If you're a Lincoln biographer, they're interesting. And if you're a Whitman biographer, they're, they're interesting. And among other things, he gave a you are there feeling to Lincoln's assassination, which he was able to do not from himself being there, but from his 
romantic, you know, his, his, his great love, Pete Doyle, who was there. And Pete Doyle shared all of his thoughts with, with Whitman, who could then say, basically, this is what it all looked like. But that it, it's a kind of Pete Doyle, Walt Whitman production when, when Whitman is talking about the end of Lincoln's life. But anyway, the first time Whitman sees Lincoln, it's on the balcony of New York's fanciest hotel, the Astor House, which was uh, pretty far down Broadway near City Hall, a bit above Trinity Church. Uh, um, it's um, where the Woolworth building is, is now. And that was a major media center of New York then. M most of the newspapers were on a little stretch of what was called um, Printing House Row at the bottom of City Hall Park. And Whitman got in an omnibus, which was a carriage with a lot of seats, you know, like a bus pulled by a horse and got stuck in traffic outside the Astor House right before Lincoln came out. And then uh, a, a weekly newspaper, Harper's Weekly, printed the image of how Lincoln looked on that balcony. So Karen, if you don't mind showing us that this is what Lincoln looked like to Whitman. Such a fabulous image, yeah. A fabulous image. So he went out on the second floor and he just spoke for a couple minutes and Whitman was basically in a traffic jam, a traffic jam of horse and buggies, not of cars. And you see, yeah, you see the front of the great Astor House. It was really a very important hotel in New York. It was like the equivalent of the plaza maybe. Um, and you see, yeah, you see the hats in the air and people hanging out of the windows and stand, I mean, there was a serious crush of humanity to see Lincoln. This is also along the same stretch of Broadway that has the parades with astronauts and movie stars and pre presidents. Um, and Lincoln just came out and Whitman described him beautifully in the later talks he gave about him as being sort of awkward that he, he, he I mean, I'm not sure I, I even completely believe this, but he said Lincoln went out on the steps and did a kind of stretch and a yawn, sure. like tens of thousands of people are looking at him. He's the most exciting celebrity who's ever come through New York at that point. And Lincoln is st stretching his arms and yawning in front of New York. It's a great story. I don't know if it's true. And then he went up to the balcony and gave a little speech, but something happened to Whitman and he was connected to Lincoln for the rest of his life. And then, uh, Later in 1861, at the end of 1861, so this is February 19th, it's two weeks before Lincoln's own inaugural address. So tomorrow we'll have Biden's. This is on the way to, to Washington for Lincoln and he's carrying with him a typeset copy of his inaugural address, which was um, very important speech in which he, he said he didn't wanna to go to war he would respect slavery where it existed, which now gets him in trouble with academics who want him to be perfectly against slavery at all times. The truth is he was trying to keep the country together and to do that, he was willing to let slavery continue where it already existed, but he wasn't willing to let it go into the West, which was, that, that was the nub of the issue. The South wasn't willing to accept that and he wasn't willing to bend, that's why the Civil War happened. Um, but he also had kind of amazing Whitman language at the end of his first inaugural address about how we must not be enemies, we must be friends. And all of us have memories, uh, memories of the American Revolution, memories of other things that have happened. And when we hear those memories, the mystic chords of memory, which is a kind of Whitmanic phrase, the mystic chords of memory. Uh, when we all remember those memories, we will come back together, especially when touched by the better angels of our nature. And that too is a kind of Whitmanic concept of these angels flying around who love America and who love all of us and who want us to be gentle with each other. So there's no evidence that they ever met. There, there are some great stories. There's a great story about Lincoln picking up 
Leaves of Grass in his law office in Springfield because William Herndon had it and taking it home and reading it. And the next day he said, he brought it back and said, I could barely save it. The women wanted to purify it by fire. And so if that's true, it's a nice story. It was told by an intern in their law office. And then there's another story that Lincoln once saw this sort of hairy man walking back and forth in front of the White House. Lincoln was in an upstairs window and he, he said, who is that guy? And one of his young assistants, probably John Hay said, that's Walt Whitman, the poet. And Lincoln said, well, whoever he is, he looks like a man. And it's another great story. We don't quite know if it's true, but Whitman told beautiful stories about seeing Lincoln on the way to his, where he liked to go for weekends, the, the, the Lincoln cottage in the soldier's home in Northeast Washington. And um, some deep connection existed between the two of them, even if they never actually met. So I love that image in Harper's because it, it shows the realization of the vision that he had had four years earlier. Ted, thank you so much. And uh, such a great graphic. I don't think a lot of us are familiar with it. It it really gives you sort of like an up to the minute idea of how everybody was seeing yeah. that moment. And the, you know, I have always loved getting those facsimile copies of the Harpers where you see the size of it. You know, you could just really yeah. dive into that moment. Um, thank you so much for bringing Oh, my pleasure, Karen. It reminds me of your of your book, Lincoln on the Verge, the, the story. There's a lot of Whitman in, in my Lincoln book. So. Yeah, thank you so much. Sure. Um, Ted took us to the Civil War, and I'm going to take us just beyond the Civil War uh, with a book that is perhaps not as well known as Drum Taps, um, but is a very favorite of mine, especially because I featured a copy of this book in the Poet of the Body exhibition that Susan and I did at the Grolier Club. Uh, it's called Memoranda During the War, although that's a, actually a good question. What is this book called? Uh, on the screen, you see both the cover and the title page of this book that actually came out, as you see on the right-hand side, um, 1875 to 76. Whitman loved stretching out those years, often to encompass a particularly important year or just to show maybe that if the book is coming out at the end of 1875, it doesn't feel like last year's book because it still has 76 on it. Um, but then you look at the, the cover and it seems to have a different title and even different dates. This one has been well loved. And actually this is a, uh, a book in Susan Tain's collection, a magnificent treasure owned by Pete Doyle, uh, who as Ted mentioned was really the love of Whitman's life. Whitman had a very intense eight year relationship with Doyle while he was down in Washington. And the only thing that really separated them was Whitman's series of strokes and the death of his mother. And that kind of caused Whitman to move in with his brother up in Camden, New Jersey and leave his Washington life with Pete Doyle behind. But Pete um, remained on and off in touch with Whitman uh, throughout Whitman's life. And Whitman actually gave Pete a copy of this book when it came out in 1876. So uh, looks like Pete or whoever owned it after Pete really loved the book. This is originally in a red book. Whitman's favored color for books during the Civil War was red. A lot of his poetry was published in green uh, covers such as Leaves of Grass, the first edition, but this one has been really well-worn, right? It's almost brown. And the title on the cover says, Walt Whitman's Memoranda of the War written on the spot in 1863 to 65. So even though the book came out 10 years later, Whitman really wanted to remind us of the, of the up to the minute feeling of what he was writing about, how, how these experiences stayed with him so closely, even a decade later that he had to write about being written on the spot. Um, and he's, he's struggling with the title, right? We call it Memoranda During the War. That's what you see on the title page. 
looks really different on the cover. And also that title page, um, according to Ed Folsom in his wonderful book, Whitman Making Books, Books Making Whitman. If you're interested in Whitman and the book arts, you must take a look at this and you can get it for free at the Whitman archive. Just type it into the search there. Uh, Ed says that this is the first time Walt's full name appears as a byline on a title page. So Whitman's really owning this book. It's very important to him. He actually tried to come out with memoranda of his war experiences during the war um, and went to his uh, publisher, James Redpath, with this idea in 1863 of publishing a book about his volunteerism. You know, he served as a nurse during the Civil War. He saw a lot of, not action on the front lines, but definitely, well, in what we call the front lines today in the hospital tents, um, uh, daily volunteer there. But Redpath, I guess, did not believe that a book about the war would sell people, I guess, just like now, they wanna read other things, maybe get away from um, history a bit. So Whitman had to wait a good 10 years um, and he sat on these notes and he really thought about it, them and then actually came out with this book. Um, I'm gonna show you a couple of things and then we wanna move to Deirdre. Now the book to me represents democracy for many reasons. Um, one of them is that this is not a book about big events or big people. This is a book very much about the common person that was involved in the war, uh, whether they were black or white, whether they were female or male. Whitman was trying in these anecdotes to highlight not grant, you know, not big topics like slavery or reconstruction but really how he saw the war from um, the ground level. And I just wanted to show you one particular part, a favorite part, burial of a lady nurse, a little note on page 39. Here is an inc incident that has just occurred in one of the hospitals. A lady named Miss or Mrs. Billings, who has long been a practical friend of soldiers and a nurse in the army and had become attached to it in a way that no one can realize, but him or her, who has had experience, was taken sick early this winter, lingered some time and finally died in the hospital. It was her request that she should be buried among the soldiers and after the military method. This request was fully carried out. Her coffin was carried to the grave by soldiers with the usual escort buried and a salute fired over the grave. This was at Annapolis a few days since. So he was not just highlighting uh, the soldiers that were coming in, but he highlighted also the nurses that were helping out and often, as in this case, giving their lives in, in very different ways to the cause. So great reading, great content. It's uh, you, you meet all sorts of characters as you're reading through these memoranda. Um, but for those of us lucky enough to see a copy of Memoranda during the war that was uh, individually bound, meaning that it came out all on its own. Later, Whitman decided to include Memoranda during the war in Specimen Days, but in 1876, it was its own book. And Susan actually owns two copies of it. Um, before preceding the title page came this Remembrance Leaf. And uh, I just love this. Um, talk about a poet who is thinking on equal terms of himself and his reader. Uh, he autographed every single one of these books that were bought. And um, I'm always moved to see that he didn't just sign Walt Whitman, right? He signed it even more personally than that. To Pete, his lover, he signed it, the author with his love. And to um, George and Kezia Grof, who I'm not sure who they were, but probably somehow affiliated with the war. Uh, this book is from their friend, the author. So, uh, and then following that, you got uh, some notes about Whitman, some very personal details about the author himself, you know, uh, autobiographically speaking, but the intimacy of this book, the experience of ha looking at a, a remembrance title page autographed especially to you by the author. Um, I feel like this also is just an indicator of how Whitman 
really sought to break down that wall, that traditional wall between what a, what an intellectual is and what a common reader is. Um, so Deirdre, I am sorry, we're leaving you with very little time, but we can run over a bit and we should, because I know you have two amazing things to show us. Um, okay, um, thank you for the opportunity. Um, I chose two artists who touch upon issues involving democracy. I also provided links to, they're on the website right now that illuminate the work of the artists. I'm going to discuss more biographical information on the artists and links to their works can be found on these links. My curatorial focus has been on artist books, books made by artists, art in book form. When asked to participate in the talk today, I had many, many artists to choose from. And I chose Clarissa Sly and Russell Marrett, whose work I have been following for several years. I had collected their work as well as the work of many other artists for the Brooklyn Museum Library's artist book collection. Now in my role as an independent curator, I continue to follow their work. In addition to Brooklyn, both artists have had their work exhibited at the Center for Book Arts in New York City and several other institutions nationally and internationally. Could you sh show the first slide? Of Thank course. You. This is Clarissa Sly in front of her installation entitled 100 Americans, A Presence of the Past in Philadelphia which was commissioned by the Rosenbach Museum and Library in 2007. Sly had taken digital portraits of citizens of African descent in the streets of Philadelphia and hung them as part of an introduction to the museum's exhibit on African-American histories. This was a facet of a larger installation she worked on that explored the legacy of the civil rights movement through oral histories, images, and archi archival resources. Uh, first, let's take a look at Clarissa. Mm -hmm. I had included her work in the Walt Whitman's Words Inspiring Artists Today show mm -hmm. at the Center for Book Arts and in the legacy of lynching, confronting racial terror in America that highlighted the work of the Equal Justice Initiative held at the Brooklyn Museum in 2017. I will provide a very brief bio on Clarissa. She has a long and illustrious career. She was originally from Virginia, now lives in Asheville, North Carolina. Her educational credits reflect her wide range of interests, including a BFA and MFA mm -hmm. from Howard University, an MBA from Wharton School, and a BS in mathematics from the Hampton Institute. Clarissa's early school years were disrupted by the politics of the day. While in high school, she was a lead plaintiff in the 1955 school desegregation case in Virginia. Eventually her schoolwork led to careers in math and science, working for NASA, followed by work in the New York business world. She then turned her energies on working and teaching in New York City for 30 years. She taught at NYU, School of Visual Arts and the University of Pennsylvania. She quote, organized a landmark exhibition still talked about today entitled Coast to Coast, a Women of Color National Artist Book Project, which traveled nationally in the 1980s and presented at the Center for Book Arts. In addition to the Brooklyn Museum and the Center for Book Arts who work is represented in the collections and exhibited by many other institutions including MoMA, the Walker Art Center, the Library of Congress, the National Gallery of Art, and the National African American mm -hmm. Museum at the Smithsonian. She's also been a recipient of several international and national awards, including awards from the International Center for Photography and the National Endowment for the Arts. Her papers are representing work, her work from 1950 to 2010, which are in the U Duke University archives. I see the second slide. Okay. Sure. Thank you. Uh, these are images from my mother, Walt Whitman and me, 
um, a book that Clarissa created for the exhibition at the Center for Book Arts, celebrating the 200th anniversary of Whitman's birth. In this book, she recorded her response to a 1940 edition of Leaves of Grass. She has created many books and installations to document, deconstruct, and address issues related to oppression as she has personally witnessed and experienced. Her art and research have covered a wide range of topics key in American history, such as civil rights, genealogy, gender studies, and slavery. In her role as a storyteller, she collages text and images into tactile visual narratives. She weaves together cultural, historical, personal, and political to explore concepts of memory and perceptions of boundaries. Her work is focused on identity, social justice, history, and change. And she uses her art to transform pieces of painful history of terror and justice and injustice into something entirely new and inspirational. The next slide, Karen. So these are images from Transforming Hate, an artist book, which we exhibited at the Brooklyn Museum. This book was created for an exhibit at the Holter Art Museum in Montana. The Holter, working with the Montana Human Rights Network, invited artists to alter or incorporate portions of white supremacist literature that had been donated by a defecting hate group leader. The exhibition, Speaking Volumes, Transforming Hate, included her installation of a crown with streamers made of nearly a, a thousand paper cranes from the folded pages from white supremacist books. To quote Clarissa, the words were full of hate. I remembered the Japanese legend that whoever folds 1000 paper cranes so pleases the gods that they will be granted a wish. The installation also included the book, Transforming Hate, that explored her experience working with the books, the white supremacist books. The artist book beautifully evokes the emotions that she experienced as she examined the racist materials and decided how to deal with them. The book, encased with a gold paper cover with a folded crane, as you can see in the slide, takes the viewer through Sly's life from her early childhood memories to adulthood and her experiences with hate. Interspersed throughout the book is text, photographs, drawings, and images of folded cranes. Her comments guide the viewer on the voyage from page to page as she questions whether forgiveness can transform hate. The book's beauty overshadows the incidents of hate told by the artists that have impacted her life and others. The next slide, Karen. Mm -hmm. Thank you. In this artist book, um, and this is Clarissa talking about transforming. In this artist book, historical elements are used as a framing device to construct my own personal narrative within our shares, within our society's shared history of trauma. This journey began when I finally allowed myself to face the reality of white supremacist books. The concept of making artwork that transformed printed hated materials seemed a perfect fit with my exploration of one's place within the historical narratives of race, class, and gender. That box of books made me realize that the conditioning to hate is very much alive and that the recruitment of others to hate those are seen as who are seen as different continues to this day. So true. Um, can we see the next slide? Sure. So the next artist is Russell Marrett. And this is an image of him working on his letterpress. The New York based artist, type designer and letterpress printer who is known for his elaborately printed fine press books and artist books. He began his career printing in San Francisco using traditional letterpress technology, and he apprenticed with several master printers. He then moved to Somerville, Mass. to work at the Firefly Press. Then he returned to New York in 1993, where he began printing and bookbinding at the Center for Book Arts, 
where he was an artist in residence in 1996. And shortly thereafter, he set up his own studio and press. At that time, he began teaching himself to design typefaces, leading to a multi-year study of letter forms before he completed his first typeface in 2008. In 2011, he began working to convert some of his type designs into new metal typefaces for letterpress. Since then, he has produced four metal typefaces, including what he calls Hungry Dutch, along with suites of metal printing ornaments. He's created over 40 editioned and unique books and manuscripts reflecting his in-depth study of the evolution of type design and letter forms. His books often feature typefaces he has designed with a focus on communicating the ideas of the specific text. Taught, lectured frequently on letterpress printing, bookbinding, and the private press book at several institutions. The Library of Congress has acquired his archive of type and book design along with his books. Um, I'm now, can I have the next slide? Sure. Karen, thank you. So um, this is an image of a broadside, America is not for special types, which we exhibited in the Whitman exhibit held at the Center for Book Arts. When I was organizing the Whitman ex exhibition for the center, I spoke and wrote to many, many artists about Whitman's influence on their lives and work including uh, Clarissa and Russell. Russell responded to my question questions in a few email exchanges. You know, I have been designing Walt Whitman books in my head for 30 years, but never managed to make one. But it is strange you should write because I'm just about to print a piece of ephemera with text by him. It is an excerpt from his conversations in which he discusses the importance of immigrants to America. I'm printing it in a new metal type face of mine that's still in process meaning I don't yet have the punctuation. The analogy being that America without immigrants is like language without punctuation. I chose the text for many reasons. The two most significant of which are its general relevance to our current political climate and the relationship to Whitman as a printer. In his capacity as printer, he undoubtedly had to make do with limited resources from time to time which is why I enjoyed setting it before the Hungry Dutch punctuation had been completed. The lack of punctuation makes readers slow down a little as they parse clauses, etc., giving the words a little more weight and a bit of an alien quality. The ideas Whitman is expressing should be fundamental American principles, but they make less and less sense under DJT. And we all know who that is. The Whitman correspondence from 1888 concerning his ideas on immigration is elegantly presented in letterpress with the typeface Merritt invented and printed on vintage Whitman paper. Mm -hmm. I have the next slide. Thank you. Russell's work continues today with the creation of three constitutions which will be published this spring. He will publish these three versions of the Constitution. And could I see the next slide? So I think we have another. Yeah, there we go. Um, you'll publish three versions of the Constitution, one with actual text and two representing interpretations of the original text. One volume is an internet version and one represents a redacted version where the artist highlights keywords and phrases turned upside down. The inverted pieces of type print as black rectangles, similar to what is found in other redacted government documents, where one is left wondering what was in the original text. Both of these artists create dynamic work that teaches upon, that touches upon issues facing all of us now and in the past. Through these compelling works, these artists address issues of race and prejudice that have been continually challenging our democracy since its very beginnings. They echo the democratic ideals found in Whitman's words written 200 years ago. Thank you. 
Oh my goodness, Deirdre, thank you so much. I mean, I remember seeing them in the exhibition, but to get them highlighted with such detailed background is so useful. And I feel like we've traveled quite a bit, friends. We've gone from eating excrement to, uh, you know, just America not being for special types. Maybe that's the perfect segue to Inauguration Day 2021. You know, maybe that's the journey. Um, normally speaking, we take questions or, or try to have a chat, but I see that we're quite a bit of time over. Is Are there any final thoughts, guys, Ted, Deirdre, anything, especially either tying in what you said or thinking about tomorrow, that momentousness having to do with our, our Walt? I'm just feeling great, Karen. I think Whitman would be thrilled that we have this exciting young representative of America uh, out there. Um, but I, I don't mean to be facetious. It, it is a great night. It's, it's a night in which we are taking stock and thinking about ourselves and, and resolving to do better. And I, I think Whitman would be really happy with the way the American people worked out some of the the problems and got through a really hard election and, and it is a good day. So I, I won't say more than that, but I'm really happy. Yeah, I don't feel like, and, and I think Ted, you would know maybe more about this than I do, but there wasn't a point during reconstruction that Whitman felt good about a turn in politics. It just kind of went downhill for him, right? From yeah. civil war on. Yeah, so. democratic vistas not nearly as optimistic as his writings in the 1850s. And maybe that's what happens to all of us. We get a little bruised by real politics, but it's also important to retain a hope that things might get better, that things get worse, but they also get better. And I don't wanna to get too Republican and Democrat on it, everyone, but, um, I feel like if Joe Biden ever does anything else, he was the right man at the right time to get us through a hard year and a hard election and to get us focused on some things we need to be focused on like the coronavirus and to get back to the idea that the government serves the American people. It's not a cult of an individual, it's, it's for everybody. So that's pretty political, but I'll, I'll hold it at that. And I'm just really happy with where we are and I hope we have a good day tomorrow. Thank you. And Deirdre, I guess you're giving you. us artists that um, bring us forward and give us uh, you know, contemporary visions of, of the ideas of democracy. I really loved Russell Marat's uh, exclusion of the punctuation. And I think <laughs> His analysis of that was spot on, man. I really had to slow down and and think carefully. I'll have to remember that with my students to occasionally leave out my punctuation and get them to pay <laughs> more attention. But just thinking about these, um, you know, these voices of change, you know, this, th these change makers that you bring to us today. Any thoughts about Inauguration Day and, and Whitman's continuing influence? Um, I keep thinking about that wonderful scene back in, I think it was 1855, where Walt Whitman, as he was five years old, witnessed General Lafayette coming up off the ferry from Manhattan, up the streets in Brooklyn, and witnessing the, um, the, um, the cornerstone of the Brooklyn Apprentice's Library, which he worked at many years later. And just sort of seeing this and being inspired by Lafayette, and his vision of democracy in America. I think that really stuck with him. Uh, and he talked about you know, many years later as you know, sort of a, a major point in America's future. So he, great visionary. Deirdre, thank you so much for evoking that. Um, thank you for being here. Ted, thank you so much for, yeah. for kind of sending us into Inauguration Day. Happy Inauguration Day, everybody. I know where you will be tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> um, and uh, thank you everybody out there for, for tuning in. Um, wonderful to know that you're out there and please do join us next time 
February 16th, again, a Tuesday. We're going for Tuesdays this year at 6 p.m. for that tribute to our dear friend, Greg Trupiano. Um, thanks, everyone. Thank and, you. Uh, yeah, good start to 2021, guys. Thanks.